Father, thanks again just for time to get together here. God, as we uh, just look at Israel a little bit from another perspective and uh, just talk about our trip and answer some questions. Oh, God, we invite your presence here. Mm -hmm. We look forward to just a sweet, sweet time in Israel this June. In Jesus' name. Alright, those of you watching online, welcome, glad you're with us. I believe this is Israel 101 Session 9, I think, but I could be wrong, right? I think so. Something like that. If not, whatever it is, glad you're here. A little bit different today. I'm kind of excited today for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the main reason is this is the young man I'm about to introduce you to who uh, gave us twin grandsons. So we, we really like him, you know. He's, he's nice to our daughter, so we like him for that, and he's just our son we love. But Brian went with us on our last Israel trip and kind of learned a little bit about Israel trip with us and all. And now this time he'll be co-leading it with me. So we'll be kind of sharing duties on this one. This is going to be awesome. Uh, when we planned this trip the first time he was there in the planning meeting in Israel and everything. We've uh, changed a little bit uh, around, but uh, Brian's here today. So I'm going to have him do a lot of talking today. And then uh, we'll do some question and answer if you have questions. But I want you to get Israel from another perspective. You keep getting it from my perspective. We try to get it to you from Connie's perspective, from Sandy's perspective, from Bouget's perspective. And uh, now you'll get it from Brian's perspective. Um, Brian has been married to our daughter, been part of our family for 10 years now. And um, we have two little grandsons, they're two and a half years old, Noah and Micah. This is our middle daughter, Christie's family. And um, Brian uh, met Christy at Liberty University, freshman year in college. Uh, they dated throughout college for four years. I had made a deal with our daughter from the time she's a little girl. She couldn't get married until she got her degree. She graduated on a Saturday, and the next Saturday she got married. So she kept her deal, and uh, cut it kind of tight, but she did that. And um, Brian continued in, in school, got his first master's out there at Liberty. And then he got another master's at Liberty. And now he's a professor, online professor at Liberty in theology, and theology, Bible studies, theology. And now he's in Dallas at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary getting his PhD. So he just keeps going to school, and we're loving it and all proud of him. But um, that's what we're going to do today. So today you're going to get Brian's perspective on Israel. Interrupt him whenever you'd like, yeah. and ask questions. And uh, when he's finished, we'll just keep asking questions, and we're going to just do a... Uh, Israel 101 from another perspective class. I think you'll enjoy it a lot. So come on up, Brian. James, you might have to adjust the camera. He's a lot taller than I am. Let's see how it goes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, good evening, guys. I uh, just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity to come share uh, my experience with you. Thank you for the uh, Internet folks for giving me just a little bit of your afternoon as well. Um, I don't really know where to start or where to begin uh, just talking about this trip, so I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. Uh, like you heard from Pastor Khan, I've pretty much been studying the Bible as a career, as a thing that, that I do um, for 15 years now. Uh, that's where I got my de undergraduate degree. That's where I got two masters at Liberty, um, doing more work, as you heard from uh, Dallas Theological Seminary in the same area, so I feel like I had a really good base of knowledge when I went over to Israel for the first time, three years ago now, and even then I learned a ton. Um, in school you, you get your Bible classes, but they, they make you take some Old Testament history, some archaeology, some Bible backgrounds where you learn about the temple or kings or just things like that. But it's, it's a completely different experience actually getting your hands on something. Mm -hmm. It feels like there's a different degree of knowledge and understanding and even memory when you can add more senses involved. You know, it's, it's just it's a little bit more concrete that you can grasp and hold on to. Um, it's kind of like... If, if you're studying a football playbook, it's it's one thing, but actually getting hit when you try to run the ball down the field is a completely different experience. Um, if you study a cookbook and learn how to you know, make a cake, it's a different experience from getting your hands in the dough and cracking eggs and the, the smell and the feel of 
salt and sugar and, and all that kind of thing. So, uh, I mean, even meeting me, some of you haven't met me today, but you've heard stories. You may not have realized how tall I am or <laughs> what kind of handshake I have or how I part my hair or just things like that that you don't... Yeah, I have hair. Yeah, <laughs> that is a different experience. <laughs> Really? This is yeah. kind of really? Then we can go there. <laughs> oh, man. See? These, these are... Yeah. These are kind of intangibles that you don't get just reading about them or hearing a story. As good as that is and as vital as that is to your faith, there's the, just the experience of seeing and smelling and feeling the things that you read about in the Word is ridiculous. Um, the idea that you read a verse that says better to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea than cause a little one to stumble. You see what a millstone is. You, you can remember the texture, the weight. It's, it's significant. Um, when you're learning about Jesus walking into the, the, the temple or even Satan tempting to throw himself off, you, you know that kind of precipice. You've felt the wind standing up there yourself. You, you know the kind of height that that's involved. And so there are all these intangibles that you don't really grasp just reading it and just memorizing it. Um, and we were talking on the way over here about Chuck Smith talking about how the the Israel experience is like a year or even a, two years of Bible study or Bible school. And I don't even know if there's a way that I can quantify it. It, it seems like so much more than that. Because again, even studying it for 10 to 15 years as my job, there were still things I never thought about, never considered, just different aspects of geography or, or topography or, or again all these little tangible things that make everything feel much more concrete much more real and it's funny this morning I was thinking about uh, our kids apparently learned about first John and if memory serves first John 1 starts off with John saying I'm communicating to you the things that I've seen the things I've heard that I've seen with my very eyes the things I've touched and we're not communicating a Jesus to you who is a phantom or a figment of our imagination. No, I laid my head on his breast. I, I remember grasping him. And so, again, to, to have that sort of witness, uh, as somebody who comes back from Israel, you can, you can say those same exact things. It's not just academic knowledge. It's not just, I'm imagining this kind of thing. It's, no, I've, I've been there. I've held on to it. I've swam in the Sea of Galilee just like Peter did. You know, I, I, I walked on the same exact stones of the Temple Mount that Jesus walked on. You know, I, I saw a tree that one of the disciples may have fallen asleep under in Gethsemane. So it's just, again, there's a nearness and a concreteness to everything that you see and do over there. And that's, that's what's significant about the trip to me. Because yes, I learned some more academic knowledge, and that's cool. And that <laughs> I use that in my in my own studies. But again, the the, the tangibility, the the ability to say you've been there and smelt it and felt it and saw it with your own eyes is is uh, yeah indescribable. It's kind of uh, you can't really measure it with years of study. It's just different knowledge altogether. So. That's my perspective on the trip. Uh, does anybody have any sort of questions, any sort of comments, observations? I am here. <laughs> what made the biggest impact on you there? If you could give one or two. So. One or two biggest impacts. Well, uh, I'd imagine the, believe it or not, the geography of it, everything being so close. Like I, I, I personally, this is this may not be the case for you guys, but I'll be reading scripture and I'll see, you know, Jesus went left Jericho and went into here, and part of my brain just kind of goes click off, 
you know, the, mm -hmm. something about place names or directions or just uh, part of my brain is just like, okay, that's not important. Just get to the part where he preaches something or tells me I'm supposed to do something or not do something, whatever. But just part of my brain kind of shuts off when it comes to geography for some reason. But when you are actually standing on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem and the walls and everything are just, they're right there. It's not like, you you know, you picture Jesus walking up to this mountain and it's like miles away or there's there's no nearness to everything, but when, when I was standing in Jerusalem, it was, it was odd to me to have that proximity. It, it just, again, it, it's weird. My brain doesn't work that way. It just it turns off or it, I just picture things differently. And again, to make everything so concrete, it would be like, oh, okay, so this is the distance, or this is how, how broad this was, or everything is so close. That kind of took me aback. I didn't realize that personally. Um, that was a big, big impacts. Hmm. Well, I guess it's it's the same kind of stuff along that lines. I was thinking of uh, even when we went to Caesarea Philippi, where you know Jesus is apparently preaching and telling people that you know the gates of hell will not stand against this church. Well right behind you when you're standing there are is a pagan well to the god Pan. So again there's there's a vividness to even the preaching where you just imagine again I don't know again how my brain works. I don't know about you guys, but you're reading it and you're just reading as if Jesus is saying the gates of hell will not stand against just kind of academic, but he has something to point at, something to look at. There's and even for the disciples it wasn't just sit there and listen and everything's academic. No, there's a richness and a vividness to even the words that we're reading in Scripture that you don't grasp. Again, I think read, sitting here and reading it, as important as that is, there's just a, a vividness to the word that you don't, I think a lot of it has to do with just Western readers, just we don't, we don't do that. So, yeah. Caesarea Philippi was one of my big um, moments, I guess, too, because it was impressive to me to even see the way that, I mean, I don't know if we knew for sure how they used that area in worship, but, you know, we were talking about um, how the waters that naturally run through there are red sometimes because of the sacrifices that the pagans would do for this in this area mm -hmm. and it's not you know it's not like what maybe you've seen in a movie where you know there's a stone and then there's a knife and there's a, <laughs> a scary looking man yelling and doing you know I mean it's beautiful it's a beautiful backdrop with this cave and I mean green everywhere mm -hmm. and these sort of alcoves that you can see where you could kind of imagine like if if you were somebody who was going to do this you could see how they could use the space and it just, I, I don't know, I just, I guess I never really realized how um, real and um, what, what a big part of life those pagan sacrifices and those, those things that they did, I didn't realize how big it was mm -hmm. and, and the sort of impact, I mean, that's what Jesus was having to fight against. I mean, they have their whole area all set up, and he's having to say, look, you know, it's not just a little thing you knock over and you move on with life. It's, it's, it's built yeah. into a cave, <laughs> you yeah. know. So just seeing, I don't know, I was just really impacted with the enormity. Maybe that's what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. the enormity of, of idolatry and, pag and the pagan rituals that were going on in that area. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then he just bold, you know, walking right up, right into whatever's going on, saying, you know, this is not this is not the way. So it it was extremely impactful. The accessory of both I was. It's funny how that sort of pagan practice again. We just assume that you'll be able to see it 
when you walk past it because yeah. there'll be pentagrams and people sure. wearing terrible clothes and carrying. No, it's, it's actually gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, I have a wonderful picture of of you two actually yeah. at that place. She um, uh, she's on your back right. and and just smiling, and it's a beautiful <laughs> picture yeah. against the backdrop of something that was Pagan used temple, for something yeah. you know not a very ungodly practice, but. Mm -hmm. um, Some of my best pictures are from that same yeah. place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's gorgeous. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful, for sure. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. Well, one of the things that probably won't mean a lot to you, but it may to some of the people here, is I had a friend that was went over there several years ago, and, and I shop at Costco on um, Eubank. Mm -hmm. And she said, when you're pumping gas there, just imagine this whole parking lot, that's the Sea of Galilee, and the, the wind coming down, because I stand out there and pump gas, and that wind's coming down and turning <laughs> it around, and uh, I don't pump gas there when the wind's blowing without thinking of Israel. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. She said, just think of that, of the whole parking lot being the Sea of Galilee, and the wind's coming down through the, the uh, mountains, <laughs> the, right. and, you know, it was a very visual picture for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that, I think that's it, that's just the visual, mm -hmm. the, the analogy and all that sort of thing, and even, I'm thinking of <clears throat> when we were up at the, I think it was in the Golan Heights, when we were looking at the road to Damascus, where it could have been the border between Israel and Syria, and thinking of Acts 9, how... Paul was blinded by a light, and when we were out there, it was the sun was right overhead, and even with sunglasses, you're like squinting just because it's so bright. Mm -hmm. to, so to think of a light being brighter than that and blinding, blocking mm -hmm. out even the sun, again, it's just little, mm -hmm. little weird things like that that really stand out from now on. Mm -hmm. I'm sure 50 years from now, if I'm still alive, I'll be reading that scripture and thinking of the brightness of that day, just from being there one time. So, yeah, I think again, this this the intangibles. This you can't really put a a price or a time frame on how valuable those kinds of experiences are to me. Anyway. Mm -hmm. so. Any other thoughts, questions? You were teaching up in a Capernaum. Okay. Alongside that synagogue and the millstone and everything. Yeah. That was one of the highlights of the whole trip for me. Oh, really? Was you teaching up there. And um, I don't know if you guys remember it, but when you were done, you said something that just thrilled my heart. And you got done teaching, you said, Boy, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. um, talk a little bit about the funness of learning, the funness, if that's the right word of reading the Word, teaching the Word, mm -hmm. letting the Word come alive to you, and how they can experience the same thing, which is reading the Word and letting it come alive to them. Okay. I, I guess I haven't made that clear enough. <laughs> More so yet. Go yeah, ahead. I'm, I'm just trying to say, just having read it for as long as I have, that there's a different level I think that you achieve again when you experience it. The I believe when I when we were at Capernaum, I was talking out of John six, and I did that because Jesus talked at Capernaum, uh, and he said the words in John six, and, was, and so I thought that would be kind of a fun sort of analog, just not personally, just to be selfish and say, hey, I'm going to teach the same thing Jesus taught in the same place Jesus taught, but just to get that experience, and if I remember right, at Capernaum, the, the synagogue, at least the floor, is still original. You can still walk on that. Mm -hmm. So, um, man, it was so much fun, again, in that moment, taking all of that, exactly what I've been saying at the same time. Okay, here's validation of a decade and a half of study. Here's validation of two to three decades of actually being a Christian. And here is the experience of standing in possibly the same exact place where Jesus and the disciples and the Jewish leaders of the time were. That's nuts, I think, to me. Uh, 
again, the, the, there's a difference between studying gravity and having an apple hit you on the head. It's, it's, it's different just reading about the scenario and then going and putting your foot on the stone and actually smelling the smells and, and feeling the leaves or the fruits or whatever it might be. It's just, again, uh, I still, I, again, I'm describing it as ridiculous because I still almost don't believe it. Just what kind of an opportunity you can still have to do that today. So, yeah. And here's, what, here's what is in store for you all. Watch this now. Sandy and Verger in Capernaum. Brian's talked about the synagogue. From that synagogue, you walk out the synagogue. Can you see the Sea of Galilee from there? Yes. 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 Have you been to Bible school? No. But you can see that. Did yes. you ever learn that in all your studies? No. But you know it's true now. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. That's yeah. just because they were there. Yeah. And all of a sudden, yeah. Capernaum, they know it's on the Sea of Galilee. Yeah. And they know that outside the synagogue, right across the street and down maybe 40 yards is the Sea of Galilee. Yeah. So you just, you get things that you just wouldn't get. Yeah. And now when you read the Gospels, you go, wait a minute. And now, Mrs. Campbell, you're not going to have to go to Costco <laughs> to make it to Sea of Galilee. You can stay home and open your Bible and go, oh, I know exactly what that's like because I was there. And it's going to be amazing. And, right. and that's the thing that is, for me, leading people over there is the thrill is to see you get the light bulb on. We've talked about that a couple of times. Different places where the light bulb just goes on. And you go, this, I love your term, validates my faith. Mm -hmm. This validates everything I've learned. I know now this is for real. Because you read the word and what it says and what you're seeing is exactly it. The, right. the cities that Jesus cursed. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that. Yeah, and and been, like, that was crazy. <laughs> I was like, you think about a word like Chorazin, and that's, again, a word that previously I read, part of my brain would shut off, who cares what or where Chorazin is saying, just know Jesus pronounced woe on it. How does that impact my faith at all? And then you go there, and it's just a field of stones and broken buildings. Yeah. Surrounded by flourishing cities. Yeah. 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 Wow. So that's not right. Yeah. <laughs> How did this happen? Yeah, so it's little weird things like that that stick out, even. That's a good point. So are you glad you went? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll say another thing that I found that was kind of interesting that I, I didn't realize, not having been there before, is the difference between sort of traditional sites where Christian history believes Jesus may have been born or may have agonized or whatnot versus just a more kind of simple way. And I'll tell you what I mean. Like going to the, the Church of the Nativity. There's hundreds of people there fighting to get into this church and and People are actually pushing and shoving just to get there, and it's just a stone monolith, and you get down underneath, and there is this altar that has a stone, and it has bronze figurines and lamps and things that people have put on, and it's just a mass of swell of people, and it, it's nuts. And then I don't remember if it was later that day or if it was a different day. I think it was the same day. Yeah. You go over to the shepherd's field, where you just kind of walk down into a, an old school house. It's all just stone and it's empty and it's quiet and it's small. And here's what's probably a stone manger and it's small and it's just in the corner and everything is just so low key and mm -hmm. simple. And then it's like you, you look at the two and for my money, based on what I know, is that this low-key, quiet, nondescript, nothing hole in the ground, probably more like the environment of Jesus' birth than this bustling, stone, ornate altar that it's become. And it's, it's a weird kind of juxtaposition. Uh, 
So, I mean, all those churches and all those shrines and all that stuff, very cool. Again, for me, as a student of history, it's interesting to see how tradition has placed these different things and, and what has become of it. But that was a unique, again, juxtaposition to have this hustle bustle, big time, ornate stuff, and then this simple, kind of mm -hmm. humble hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where the word tell me my favorite came from. So mm -hmm. that was very, very impressive. That's good to hear because that was my thought. They, you know, society has placed all this stuff there. Am I going to be able to see anything yeah. besides the stuff they put there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to see that. Right. right. Well, that's not part of my faith. Sure. And well, I'm sure we'll we'll get to see both. But it, yeah. it's. I think it's like that in a lot of places. Even going to Gethsemane, there's the just the the garden and the trees and whatnot, and then there's the church that's been erected next to it and the stone of agony and where Jesus supposedly sweat blood. And again, that's that's nice and that's interesting to see and as a tourist and as a student you value that. But then again, you know, in your faith you turn to this just this grove of trees. And you think this is that's probably more like what I'm reading in scripture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than this now erected church and monolith on top of it. So you get both. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did you love the food? I did. Yes. So <laughs> I would ask that. <laughs> Rachel's in charge of food here, basically. So, That's awesome. Yeah. That's so awesome. Here, here's my, my food journey. I grew up very simple. My parents were divorced. My mom made just you know, chicken, meatloaf, spaghetti, pizza. On a rotation, so I grew up very simple. Some people call that picky. <laughs> I call it simple. Simple things, you know, please me. But uh, ever since going to college and, and kind of sort of growing up, I've made it a point to, I'll just eat. I'll try anything. I mean, there's a reason some people like things. I will find out why. So when I went over there, I, not officially or anything, but I reserved in my mind to eat the local stuff. food. And so when we'd get to a mall or when we'd get to a stop, it's like, okay, get your food. And I'm not going to name names or point fingers, but some people would go to McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> and some people would go to the pizza place. But I was doing falafel and hummus and mm -hmm. what else are we getting? Yeah. Shawarma, yes, shawarma. And so all of that was wonderful. That's right. Uh, I, yeah, I have no interest in doing McDonald's. kosher McDonald's, yeah. where you have to separate meat McDonald's and dairy no. and that sort of thing. That's kind of funky. Yeah. But, yeah. Talk about the meals that I had down. The hotel meals, wouldn't it mostly just buffet style? Kind mm -hmm. of, they'd have tons of nice. options. So, yeah. So much food. So much food. And it was all, all of it was good, except for breakfast dessert, I think, because again, no dairy. So those kind of cakes were funky, but everything else was <laughs> delicious. <laughs> everything else was delicious, and yeah, getting that breakfast and dinner provided for you every day of the trip—that's that's pretty helpful too. Yeah, very good stuff. So, and if you're a picky eater, might be odd at first, but at least hotel meals have options. And then again, when we stop at various places, you. You can go to a, a McDonald's or something else if that's your style too. So, yeah, very, very, very accommodating for people of all tastes, I think. So, yeah, it was, it was delicious. We're going to be there in June. It's going to be hot. Yeah. Okay. Pardon? <laughs> but uh, what about the hotel rooms? Are they cool? Do they have good cooling? Yeah, I, I don't remember enough to say that they were terribly cold or hot, which I think is a good thing. You know, it, it, it was not an issue, so okay. I don't bother to remember. Right. And I don't uh, think a man is a good one to ask that anyway. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't remember the weather being that bad. Like, it was hot, but it wasn't... I, okay, so I live in Texas, and as soon as it 
I mean, it's like at least 80 degrees year round <coughs> and muggy. So that's terrible. So going to a more arid climate uh, was better for me. But even then, different parts of the country have different kind of climate mm -hmm. zones and different elevation and different mm -hmm. access to water. So there's enough variety, I think. That the only time I was ever way, way, way overheated was when I volunteered to walk down Masada. And so I don't recommend doing that unless you have some sort of physical aptitude and four bottles of water. But that was the only time I remember ever being super hot. So, yeah. The hotels are amazing. Okay. I mean, we live and we stay in some of the best hotels over there. Yeah. Um, three, four star hotels, four star hotels and above. Uh, nice air conditioning. Uh, the accommodations are just totally first class. Um, you get there, um, your bags are there with you. They check them into your first hotel. You don't see your, your bed. Then they were going to leave, they have you put them outside your door. You see them at your next stop. So the hotels are totally first class. The mm -hmm. service is totally first class. Um, air conditioning, perfect. Um, we stay on the kibbutz for a few days, and though, although those accommodations are different, they're still very nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, What's the kibbutz? The, the, I'll, you want to explain what that is? Right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the kibbutz is just, from what I remember, it's just kind of a Jewish community sort of area. It, it felt, it felt like almost like a bed and breakfast slash motel. I mean, everything was nice. I, I had access to Wi-Fi. I was grading papers for Liberty <laughs> while in Israel, just because I, I had to keep doing my job there. So I mean, uh, that was like I remember our first hotel. I'd never been over there and look out the window and hey, there's the Mediterranean. Did you sleep and the with, beach. Your window, with your door open? I did. I yes. Yeah. 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 Door open. Not the hotel door, but they they had balcony doors mm -hmm. and you yeah. could, and then you could smell the the Mediterranean oh, sea coming in. The oh, salt sea. Yeah. oh yeah. man. Yeah. Oh man. Didn't you even <laughs> sleep on a hammock? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So I mean the. Yeah. the it's nice. Yes. The weather is nice. Accommodations were nice. Because I had somebody that I was trying to talk into going and said, oh, I don't want to go in June. You know, it would be better in the winter time. It's too hot in June. So. Let me tell okay. you my story on that one, Mr. Campbell. Um, the first time I went over to Israel as an adult, and I've been 68, but as an adult, we went in June, and it was the year of the Pan American bombing over Lockerbie, Scotland. That was my first time over. And it happened, that bombing had happened, and we were supposed to go like two months later, my first trip, learning how to do these tours. Well, there was like 60 or 70 people signed up from Albuquerque here to go. I was living in Albuquerque at the time. Or no, I was in San Antonio, down here at the Albuquerque Church. And everybody dropped off because of the newspapers. Oh, no, they're bombing airplanes. So yeah. everybody dropped off, so 13 of us went. Which was great for me because I got to know the owner of this tour company because was, he was leading it and there were 13 of us. I was like, okay, this is good. Well, two of the people on there were a pharmacist and his wife. I forget the wife's name. The pharmacist's first name is Fred. They had gone the year before during the winter in February. And they were coming back again the following year because in February the winter is the rainy season. And they were there for 13 days and six of them it was raining hard. So they would go uh, Caesarea Philippi is what they mentioned. They pulled up to Caesarea Philippi. It was pouring out, pouring. So they just said, well, right over here, if you look, you can kind of see through the rain. There's that cave kind of over in there. And over here, and then we'll just read the word here. And they took pictures from the bus window. And you couldn't see anything but rain. And then they left. And he says, you know, that's why we were glad to go in February, because we thought it's not going to be so hot. But the trick is, in the Galilee, it's not hot. Mm -hmm. The northern part of Israel, it's awesome. You don't sweat. It's just nice. Mm -hmm. And we're up there for the first week. The second week, we're in Jerusalem. It's only going to be hot in Jerusalem if you choose to walk <laughs> Jerusalem in the heat of the day. <laughs> now, a couple times we do, but we stop for water breaks and in shaded areas. And then our day off, I did this walk, a Jesus walk, from where the... the um, Last Supper traditionally is, and we walked all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, and then back out to the Praetorium, and then over to Golgotha, and then all the way back home. And we were out in the hot 
weather for about four hours, a four hour walk. Then it's hot. Don't do that. <laughs> so then where Brian hit it was Masada. That's hot. Masada's hot. You go up on top, Masada, it's hot. Yeah. But they have a cable car that takes you up there. Do that. Mm -hmm. And then don't walk back down. Take the cable car back mm -hmm. down. Much better. Much better. <laughs> no, yeah. Just so don't be foolish. You know, you're not here to prove anything. Well, I'm gonna do it. Why? Don't do it. You're young. You did it once, I bet you won't do it again. You might, but I might. Uh, yeah, I can see, I know. <laughs> most people won't do it the second time. I'll have more water this time. <laughs> I'm curious, how, how, uh, how long is the uh, trip to walk down the side? Uh, how many miles I, do you think? The walk itself, I thought it was almost two. Two, two, uh, oh, two hours? I, no, I thought it was two miles. Two miles? It took us 45 minutes to an hour to walk okay. down. I can't imagine walking up. Mm -hmm. That's kind of crazy. Is it kind of like Grand Canyon? Mm -hmm. I've never done that, actually. Oh, so I, I did don't, uh, don't Grand know. Canyon going down in two hours. It took me four yeah. hours to get up. <laughs> wow. On 110, 12 degrees. Dang. Oh. But you know why? Because I was a mimic and I didn't know. That. Oh, right. Ooh. So um, well, I was lucky I made it up. Yeah, you were. But I just yeah. kept praying and praying. <laughs> I knew because I was so stubborn. Praise God, yeah. A nurse to call. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is it cool yeah. in the morning? How do you make it? In Israel? I don't yeah. remember well, being chilly. Here. Where that path is. Masada. 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 What happens yeah. with Masada is we drive down on the bus, <coughs> okay. and it's one of four stops. We covered that last week. We're going to stop in. Uh, Qumran, we're going to stop in Elat, oh, not Elat, in, uh, in Yeti, in the Dead Sea, and Masada. So we're at Masada for a total of maybe three hours, three and a half hours total. So it's not a matter of get up early in the morning and go, because yeah. it's about okay. two hours bus right outside of Jerusalem. Okay. So you don't get to choose your time. It's going to be hot. It's going to be hot. And the only thing I remember as being terrible about that is that the lack of shade. Mm -hmm. Like you, some places are hot, but you can find a tree or something somewhere. But Masada is hot. But the way I, I justify it is that that's part of the experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you want to put yourself in the time period of what these people were enduring or dealing with, then mm -hmm. if that means I'm uncomfortable for a little bit, and even not a lot, then I'm going to experience that same way. And to the point of it being accommodating, like I said, you could either be dumb and walk down Masada or you could take a tram. There are a couple times where uh, in Megiddo, you have an option. You could walk around the far side of the city and get this bigger, longer experience, or you could take a shortcut right, right to that well. And so, depending on your physical capability, your comfort level, whatever, there are a lot of accommodations, depending on what you want to get out of it. So, I wouldn't go thinking there are things that I can't do or there are things I won't be able to see, because that's, that's not true. There's, there's always a way to facilitate you being part of the, the study, the tour. It's kind of fun. So. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. We are going to do a kibbutz study here in about three more weeks, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Spend a whole day on the kibbutz. Uh, the kibbutzim are basically communes, mm -hmm. and it's a uh, socialism, communism, from the 40s that is in Israel. And it's a, it's a communist mindset. So everybody's giftedness or their strengths are used. And they all live in this commune. If you're good with kids, you're over the kids. If you're a nurse, you're in the medical area. If you're good at cooking, you're in the kitchen. If you're a good field hand, you're in the field. Whatever your giftedness is, that's what you do. And everybody shares the same. Everybody makes the same. So that's where it's a communism type of thing. Well, it has changed now. As Israel's become more and more developed, very few people want to do that anymore. So now the kibbutzim have changed and they're, they're more uh, a dem a democratically run type of thing. And what they've done is they've switched to tourism in a very big way because tourists are coming. So they, they make these little facilities, little like Flintstone type of places, just a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here. And um, that's where you stay. And it's, the inside is nicer than a Motel 6, but not as nice as a Super 8. So the facility-wise, think of that for the kibbutz. 
but the location is everything. Mm -hmm. Because from here to the street is the Sea of Galilee. You're going to yeah. spend like what? Eight hours at night in your room anyway? Maybe. 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 You're not going to be in there. You're going to shower and yeah. get out because right. it's where you, oh man, who's going to sit in a room on that day unless you make papers? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it. <laughs> <coughs> that's it. Well, You're just going to be there. When yeah. the kibbutz was started, when uh, the Jewish people came back to Israel? In the 40s, yeah. yeah. 48, yeah. 40, yeah. It was a matter of necessity. Mm -hmm. They yeah. needed to do that to survive. And now that there's ways to make all kinds of money in Israel, the Jewish folks aren't doing that. So a lot of the kibbutzim are, are actually people from outside of Israel who are coming here. They need a place, so they're here. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, I'm, I can do this. Okay, you do that, and you have your food and your, your place to stay. Mm -hmm. Then they leave the kibbutz to go make money in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or something. So it's a little bit different now. It's just mm -hmm. a little different. But it's still sweet. It's a great environment. And it's fun. Yeah. And we just go there to so let you experience that. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's good. Really good. But the hotels, apart from there, the hotels on Metro and Sea and Jerusalem and Elat, those are very nice hotels. Very nice. And it always amazes me because I'll ask people what some of your favorite places are. And more than half the people pick the kibbutz as their favorite place to stay. Which always amazes me. It's like, really? Oh, that was great. Yeah. I remember the food being good. And like you said, it's, you get back at night and it's like, well, do you want to sit here or do you want to go swim in Galilee? <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. Of course, I'm going to go swim in the alley. Yeah. So. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. And in Jerusalem, and some of the other places, you look on the back of the door, a regular hotel room mm -hmm. is $800,000. You know, so the places that we stay are nice. very a uh, night. Yeah. yeah. So with the amount of money that we pay to go there, <coughs> you may be able to go there and stay for three days, if that. Well, not even that, including your airfare, yeah, right. for the amount that we pay and the cost that we get from mm -hmm. and stuff. So they're very, very, very nice hotels. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Clothes? Bring clothes. Bring clothes. Bring clothes. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly Bring cotton. Yeah. You, know what, you know what happens, Phoebe, is the first couple of days, mm -hmm. everybody is looking really good. <laughs> when they're wearing makeup, they're wearing their cute little outfits that they bought. The guys have their little outfits are all matching. And we're all looking really nice the first couple of days. By the third or fourth day, we know each other now. We don't care. We just don't have to be in the bus at six thirty in the morning. You got to be have eaten and be there. And all of a sudden, you'll start seeing gals just putting their hair up, putting a hat on it. Makeup, forget about it. Mm -hmm. Guys, you'll see wearing the same shirts over and over. And it's just, things change. Mm -hmm. And um, so don't worry too much about that. But you, um, the thing you do want to be careful on is there are certain places we go where women have to have their shoulders covered mm -hmm. and their knees covered. Mm -hmm. So you either bring, we, I always say like these broom skirts, bring one of those broom skirts with you. Mm -hmm. So you're wearing shorts, whatever you're wearing. You just have that broom skirt mm -hmm. in your little satchel you leave on the bus when you go places. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, we need the broom skirt. You just take that baby out, put it on there. You have a little something, a scarf, and you need to put over your shoulders. You go on in. We're good to go. We come back out. We're good to go. So dress cool. The bus sometimes gets a little bit cool, I guess, for the women sometimes. So just you might want something just to be to make sure you can cuddle up into something, a little sweater or something. But um, for the guys, nah, we're good. We're good. It's awesome. It is no problem. It's good. I'm, I'm on those sites that require modesty, guys have to wear pants too. So I'd be wearing shorts everywhere, and I brought over a single pair of gray wind pants just to quickly kind of, you know, throw them on on the bus, and then you walk out. So yeah, half of my pictures from Israel are me in gray wind pants, just because, just because we're at some sort of holy site and you need to be covered up. So. One of the things too is when we go on for supper, they prefer the guys to wear a shirt with either a collar or something like that, and something to cover your legs, something a little bit dressy for evening meal. That's just kind of what they prefer you to do. So you wear something a little bit dressier at night. So we get in at 4, 4.30, shower up, get freshened up, then go down for supper. It's good. And then we go out and eat. It's good. It's good. That's the uh, toilet being fixed. <laughs> This trip for me is one a very odd combination because when I think of vacation, I think of getting away and like relaxing and doing nothing and, and chilling. But 
in this trip, we're do actually doing a whole lot and touring a whole lot. But looking back on it, there is a very good marriage of touring like crazy and learning with, uh, let's take a break. Again, the, the, the first day being on the Mediterranean, just go to the beach, hang out. Eat whatever, walk forever, just chill. Get used to the time zone, the the, the, the climate change, whatever. Just Were you used wiping to it. little ones go, or are you leaving your uh, wife and little ones home? Probably not little ones. Christy is up in the air right now. We'll see if we can get babysitting for two weeks. <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, yeah. So uh, I loved again the the mix of the learning and the touring and the hitting the ground running with, let's hit the pool and the spa and the Dead Sea or just, so you get the, the relaxation and the vacation mixed in enough to where it's, it's a fun vacation but it's also very purposeful, I am growing and developing my faith for all time <laughs> kind of trip, so it's a good mix, I think. Well, according to our itinerary here, it looks like we don't start seeing anything over there until day three, is that correct? Yeah, what happens, Mrs. Campbell, is we leave, let's say, on a, I think we leave on a Thursday. Thursday. Mm -hmm. We leave on a Thursday. So we're going to fly wherever we fly. Let's just say our city of departure from the United States is going to be Atlanta. I'm just picking one. So we would leave here in the morning early. We'll get to Atlanta. For people that are coming from Minnesota, from North Texas, they'll typically then meet us in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Everybody comes in in Atlanta. And then we go to Tel Aviv, and that's a non-stop. But that means we're going to be leaving Thursday late afternoon, mm -hmm. and we'll get into Tel Aviv early afternoon. Well, actually, early evening. We'll get into Tel Aviv early afternoon on Friday. Mm -hmm. So that's day two already, before mm -hmm. we even get there. Mm -hmm. So then we get in on early afternoon on Friday, we get to the hotel, we have to go through customs and all of this. They give them the bus and they take our bus into the hotel. Mm -hmm. By the time we get into our rooms, it's about 6 o'clock, right between 5.30 and 6. Then we meet for a supper that Friday night is when Shabbat starts at sunset. Mm -hmm. So we want to get and be eating before the sun sets because the food is not going to be cooked anymore. So mm -hmm. we, we get there, we have this awesome meal that Friday night, that's day two. Mm -hmm. Then we go to bed that night. We're going to have a little meeting that evening. Everyone's excited. You're, you're not even going to believe your adrenaline rush. You're tired, but you're like, we're in Israel. This is crazy. And then the next morning, you're going to wake up around 4 o'clock or so. Breakfast starts at 6. And we get down there at 6. And there's about half the group is already there waiting. <laughs> we're all awake. We're all jet-legged over. This is weird. And there's this huge breakfast that day. And what we have done is this is something we just started doing recently. Most true groups don't do this. And the reason we do it, the, the owner of this tour company has been doing this since the 60s. And he was the tour guide for people like Chuck Smith, Chuck Swindoll, Charles Stanley, um, um, uh, John MacArthur. These are some of his mm -hmm. customers. And that's our, that's our group. It was like, whoa, we got this guy. <laughs> so he was in Santa Fe, staying with us for a couple of days. And I said, David, you always ask me to plan the trip. You plan my trip. And he looked at his wife, Anna, and she says, no one's ever asked me this. Here's some things I don't understand. And this was one of them, so we've been doing it ever since. He says, you get your people up from New Mexico. They fly all day long just to get to New York, to get to Atlanta. They wait for three or four hours. They get on a plane, and they fly all night long, all morning long. They get off the plane. They get on a bus. They have supper. And the next morning, we get them up. They're already jet lagged. They get up at 4 o'clock. We put them on a bus, and let's go see stuff. And he says, they paid all this money to get to Israel, and they're sleeping half the tour. I'm giving them interesting things, and they're just, they don't want to be sleeping, but they're exhausted. Mm -hmm. Why don't you let your people rest a day? And I go, hmm, that's a great idea. So that's what we do. So the second day, we get there, we eat, we spend the night. We get up the next morning, like Brian was saying, you have a great breakfast, and now you're free to do whatever you want to do. For me, we walked a little bit, we slept a little bit, we went out and played in the water a little bit. Some people walked up to Joppa. They said, we're in Israel, we want to see. Well, that's great, go. Joppa is just north of there, mm -hmm. uh, north, south of there, just south of there. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, Joppa is significant. It's where, it's where um, Jonah left when he was running from the call of God in his life. It's where Peter was 
when Peter had that dream and he saw the vision and he saw those sheets coming down. Well, it's interesting when you're there and you look at the Mediterranean Sea, you see all over the sea sheets. And you go, wait a minute, that word sheets is like sails. Whoa! He's looking at all. He sees this vision, these sails, these sheets full of animals, you know, rise and eat, rising. That took place in Joppa. Well, our hotel is walking distance to that area. So if you want to go up there and say, man, this is where Jonah took off running. This is where Peter had his vision. You can go there. And there's nothing to see there. There's no sights there. They have a building for the traditional site where Peter has a dream. Yeah. Give me three shekels, I'll let you walk in. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever. we don't know where that was. But you get a chance to kind of see the area. Some people want to do that. By all means, do it. Some people say, I just want to go have a, my falafel right now. Okay, go have a falafel right now. <laughs> Um, you want some ice cream? Have some ice cream. You want to sit on the beach? Sit on the beach. You want to sit by the pool? We have a hotel with a nice pool. I just want to sit by the pool and just have some hummus and just enjoy being in Israel because I need to rest because I know tomorrow we're going to hit it really hard. Mm -hmm. But this is going to be awesome. So you just rest that day. We have another meal that evening. Then we have a service that night in one of the hotel rooms. There's a communion service. We prepare for the next day. We have a little bit of worship. We let you know this is what we're going to be doing tomorrow. And then the next morning we get up, have another breakfast. Now you're not completely rested, but you're pretty good. You're, you're much better now. Mm -hmm. And since we started doing that, I've had no injuries on the trip to speak of, except one, one grandma. She sprained an ankle, but I carried her the whole trip. I'm not going to do that anymore. You sprained an ankle, you're on your own, guys. I'm not carrying her. That was when I was younger. Anyway. <laughs> At any rate. At any rate, but it's just one of those things that um, we do it that way. So that's why it looks like, wait a minute, we're not doing anything for the first three days. Right. Two days to get there, one day to rest. And that's why we leave on a Thursday, because mm -hmm. Saturday is Shabbat. Everything's closed down on Saturday, mm -hmm. and that's our rest day at the sea. So I think that's also the value of a 12, 13, 17-day trip, is that it allows you the freedom to mm -hmm. relax in between. Mm -hmm. um, I know Liberty offers seven-day trips, so does uh, Dallas Seminary, and everything is jam-packed. And I remember we were on the kibbutz, and we were, I think we were eating breakfast. And there was a tour group that walked in while we were eating, and they were just like, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and so it's like, hey, you know, we talked to them, and weren't they, weren't they from Minnesota? They were. They were from Minnesota, and it was like their second or third day touring, and it was, it was exactly like that. You land, and then you just start touring and walking and they did 14 hour days to get everything jammed in. Their plane was delayed too. Remember? Their plane was delayed so they were trying to make it up and it was yeah. bad. Yeah. Was like, oh. and they were just zombies and, and we're just kind of like, yeah we've been here and we had a day on the Mediterranean and we're just enjoying ourselves and so it's a, it's a much better structure than I think trying to cram everything in and yeah. Yeah, one of the advantages of this tour, and I can take no credit for it, none, because I didn't plan it. This tour group plans it. But he's been doing it for 40 some years. So we just let him plan it. If you were us, what would people you do? want to see. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> so we just let him do it, and we just enjoy the benefits of 47 years of experience. And it's awesome. And it's, it's amazing. The tour guide, eh, I don't know, how's the tour guide, Sandy? <laughs> He was awesome. I love him. Yeah, he was very knowledgeable, but he had a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. It was his um, second fluent language, and he was learning a third language fluently. And so, whenever I will never forget this, he he speaks very phonetically, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's it's a new language for him, and very proper. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember whenever uh, we've got. Anyway, he was he was saying the word bath. Baths. We're gonna you know, we're gonna take a bath, or we're, or we're going to a bathhouse, bath. or we're at the bathhouse, whatever. And he would say bathes. This is the bathes. <laughs> and I and I, I remember even saying, you know, you don't have to say the second syllable. And, he, and he's like, what? I'm like, never mind. It's good. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and the word sauna because it's A-U, sauna. sauna. Yeah. We're going to go to the bathhouse and have a sauna. <laughs> and it was wonderful. And he had such a good sense of humor, and he was so bright, and not just full of knowledge, but full of personality, and so kind, um, really accommodating to us. Um, for a man who is not a Christian, extremely accommodating to a faith that he absolutely doesn't go with. Very... Um, Respectful, respectful yeah. right. um, but but very 
knowledgeable. It's amazing. You would never guess that he wasn't a Christian, quite frankly. Yeah. So um, I, I really did. I enjoyed him a lot. His name was Ariel, young guy. He's one of the many tour guides that works for this company. Mm -hmm. I've had like six, five, five different tour guides, one equally as good as the next. They've all been very good, very knowledgeable, very friendly, very respectful, mm -hmm. just wonderful, wonderful folks. My personal feeling is in the book of Revelation, when there's 144,000 missionaries that get saved. Remember, they go out, in the Revelation, they go out and they evangelize. Mm -hmm. I am personally convinced that these tour guides will be part of the 144,000. They know Islam, they know Christianity, they know Judaism, <coughs> they, do, uh, they know Buddhism, they know all the religions, and uh, they have a good grasp. Right? He thinks, can you imagine if they came to Christ in a very strong way? Yeah. My yeah. thought, you know, if they're leading all these tours, yeah. you know, how do they not come to faith? <laughs> I, believe, I believe the Bible's pretty clear where it talks about that veil that God has placed over them. Simple as that. I mean, these guys are around some of the strongest evangelists <coughs> of our day. And so we just love them, enjoy them, let them see Christianity lived out in front of them. Mm -hmm. That's all we can do at this point. You're going to be pleasantly shocked to how great this is going to be. Yeah. It's going to confirm your faith. Good, Sam. Do you remember when he introduced himself? I, will, I guess I'll never forget this because he said his name was Ariel, not Ariel, because he was a tour guide, not a mermaid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually, that was really helpful because it helped me you know, remember, his name. remember yeah. how to say his name appropriately, right? Exactly. <laughs> we did it. So, people online, this is Brian, <coughs> and um, we're looking forward to meeting y'all. And um, we're about six months, seven months out, so we're getting close. We're getting closer. Pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. Let me close this out. Sure. <clears throat> God, thanks so much for the uh, opportunity for all of us to be here, bring us here safely uh, as brothers and sisters uh, in Christ. And I pray that uh, as we approach this trip that you would constantly be preparing our hearts, preparing our minds in such a way that we would have the most impact on us, that you would keep us safe, that you would just show us exactly um, how rich of a history and how, how deep of an impact that your son and all of your followers have had in that region as, mm -hmm. as we can just contribute and, and be a part of that same faith story. So <coughs> we'll just continue to guide and direct us as we prepare for this trip. Uh, we, we trust you and we, we just place it in your hands. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.